Revelation today, Revelation chapter 2, and I think, um, I think let's just pause for a minute after you turn there and we'll pray for James and Sheila as they make that trip, big trip coming up, Lord will keep them safe and watch over them. Pray for Steve's healing, Steve's going to be our song leader for the next few weeks, we need that. Sore diaphragm to be strong, right? <laughs> Recovered. So let's bow together and just lift up this couple as they travel. Most Holy Father, we just lift up your uh, children to you today. We know that they're your servants and wherever they go, they're faithful to lift up the name of Jesus as we just sang about. Um, and they're faithful to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and Him alone. So, Father, I pray that your grace, not, not the saving grace we think of, but that's that kind of general, abundant flow that you give to your children would just not only overflow their lives from outside, but, Father, I pray it rise up from within them through the power of the Holy Spirit that you would prepare hearts ahead of time so that as they meet people along the way, they would be ready. And that when James and Sheila come along and uh, sow the seed, that there would be a quick harvest during that time. God, so uh, empower their witness, prepare the fields, give them a safe trip, watch over them, and I, we ask that you would bring them back home to us safely. And Father, we also pray for Steve specifically today, as next week he will step up here in the pulpit and lead us in our song service while James is out. We just pray you'd help us diaphragm to recover and that he would be strong in voice and lung next week and just be able to sing your praises and your glory and your honor. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. It's been a while since we've been in the book of Revelation, so um, I'm not going to go back and fully kind of re-preach, you know, the early part of the church of Pergamos, but I do want to kind of remind you that when we are in the book of Revelation, we saw basically, um, we saw Jesus in his glory in chapter 1, which I think was very important in setting up for the uh, pastors of the churches um, to understand the uh, sobering messages uh, to the churches that we see in chapter 2 and into chapter 3. Um, most of us, maybe who have done some Bible study, probably most all of you in this room, you're aware of the fact that these churches were literal historic churches, most of which have been basically stamped out. Um, but the gospel hasn't been. It's spread out and it's spread all over the globe. Um, but that's, that just kind of shows us something. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But we also would say that these seven churches represent different age times or uh, let's say seasons of time from the birth of the other church all the way until the rapture when the church is removed out right before the tribulation period. Um, so we see that that covers that period of time, however long it's going to be. It's been, you know, over 2,000 years now. Um, hopefully it won't be much longer, but if it is, it's covering all of that. And so we recognize that. We can see kind of the... Um, sort of the characteristics of the early church and we see the characteristics of the next one that came along or at least kind of as it relates to the church spreading and those sorts of times seasons if you will but then we have also kind of taken the um uh the idea that these seven churches are also represented almost in every single church you can find aspects or people groups even within the body of Christ today who might be uh, Laodicean in their compromise 
and their drifting and their cold or lukewarmness towards God. You might find church groups or even individuals in a church who are the Pergamos church, who are who are who have faltered, if you will. They've not been faithful to keep out false doctrine, and they've they've accepted, if you will, the doctrines of Balaam and the Nicolaitans, which we'll talk about not on this week, but next week. And so you get what I'm saying. The, the suffering there is always in the body of Christ at large in the world right now. There are people suffering for the faith and. Uh, most of that in other countries. We, we are beginning to see some persecution in our in our nation, but it's not yet so much physical as it is just sort of cultural. But in some nations like China and like um, you know Iran and other places, man, they're they're hunting people down still and and killing them because of their faith in Jesus Christ. So they're kind of the some aspect of the Smyrna church, if you will. You, you get what I'm saying, right? So we've seen all of that, or we've talked about all that, and we have already covered two. We're now into the third church, which is the Pergamos church. We're talking about the faltering church, and I've already talked about up to this point in previous weeks. If you've not seen these, they are on the Facebook page. They're on um, Evenings and LJ, is what I call it. And so if you type in on Facebook, uh, YouTube, Evenings in LJ, it'll take you, and you'll probably see my ugly mug on there. And then you can see that not only do I have lessons from way back when we were quarantined during, uh, you know, the corona nonsense, and even up till today, Pergamus, you'll see some messages there. There are two different headings. One has like four videos, and the other one has a lot of videos. So, you know, just kind of pick and choose as you want. But that's Evenings in LJ. And then I'll also post these for a short period of time on our Facebook page. We don't do it live anymore because our sound was not good. So I found rest record it and then we'll put it on later. So you can always go on a little later and take a look. But anyway, so if you want to go back and get the details of the early part of Pergamos, this is actually our third message in this one church. It's so rich. It won't be our last either. I, I guarantee you we got at least one more to go. So up to this point, when we look at chapter uh, number two, beginning in verse number 12, we notice that we discussed as a group, or I preached to you, proclaimed to you as a group, that we sort of see this grim opening to the church of Pergamos. It's like, you know, it's not exactly what you would want to hear if Jesus steps in the back door today. You wouldn't want him to step or step in and somebody said, well, oh, there's the one with the sharp two-edged sword. It kind of gives you the idea that uh, maybe judgment is at hand or the smiting might be at hand. And so it's kind of a grim opening to me to this church. But there's a reason for that because they had compromised and they were faltering in their uh, exercise, if you will, of their relationship with God in what I would call the early corporate church. Now, what we're going to find is in this particular church, there are those who had compromised and were maybe even unsaved, but were in the church. But then there are those in this church who are faithful to Jesus, but had allowed the compromise to enter in. And what I find very reassuring as a believer is that Jesus looks at this church and he says, hey, I want you to fix this. I want you to fix this. If you don't, I'm going to come again and I'm going to fight against who? Them. He's not talking to those that are being faithful who are loyal unto the Lord Jesus Christ. But he's talking about those who are actually worldly people who have simply adopted sort of this church veneer in order to take advantage of church people. We see that, I'm telling you, we see it in the modern church all over America. It, it, people do what they do for the money, for the prestige, for the pride, for the, for the, the glory that they get from it. You're going to see that's really what I think was going on at the church of Pergamos. So we have this grim opening. But also notice in verse 13 that he came along and he gave a gentle confirmation. Remember that in verse number 13? I know thy works, he says. I know your deeds. I know you, I know you toil. I know you make an effort to advance the kingdom of God. He's speaking to the faithful believers, those who are truly born again inside the organized uh, 
religious system we call, you know, what many call the church. We know the true church are those that are born again, right? But sometimes a church body or a group of people gathered together, they're not all wheat, right? There's tares and wheat mixed together sometimes. So he says, I know those of you who are truly wheat. I know your works. I know where you dwell. He says, I know you're living in a wicked society. I know you're living in a perverted world. I know you're living in, in an age where it's very corrupt. It's, it's twisted beyond what we can imagine, right? What we would have ever thought we would live through. We're seeing that in the day that we're in. Well, the same was true in the church of Pergamos. And then he says, but you hold fast my name. I like that, don't you? The believer's responsibility is to cling to Jesus, right? Cling to Jesus. Jesus alone, right? And then he says, and have not denied what? My faith. Faith that is built in me. So very important terminology that we see. And I kind of see a general confirmation in the midst of sort of the strong message where Jesus says, I'm going to deal with compromisers. You can bet on it. However, you who are faithful unto me, I know where you're at. I know you're in a difficult spot. But listen, if you keep allowing this, sooner or later, I'll come deal with it if you don't. All right? So we do have the responsibility. Now, after these two verses, we recognize, and I, and I want to get this to you because I think we're living in a very, uh, I heard Jerry Vines one time preach a message uh, uh, called Pitching Their Tents Towards Sodom. And uh, many people, many, many believers are pitching their tent towards Sodom. They're, they're focused on the world. They love the world. And we know First John says, don't do that. Love not the world, neither things of the world. So their tent is pinched, pitched towards to uh, Sodom. But then he talks about the fact that there's nobody that will preach the truth. And, and he said this. Um, I'm not going to quote it exactly, so it's on record on the video, so I'm going to say that. It's not exactly what he said, but I remember, this was way back in 89 or something when I heard this message. He said something about because all the preachers in the pulpit are a bunch of lily liver and lacy preachers. <laughs> and they're too afraid to preach the truth. Wow. And so I think if that was true back in 1989, boy, we have an epidemic of it today. And so hopefully, as your pastor, uh, the under-shepherd under Jesus Christ, I'll be faithful to preach, thus saith the Lord, okay? And um, sometimes it's a little bit of an irritant to us, even to me. I mean, I'll be honest. I'm still at war with this members like Paul said he was. And there are times when I read something and I say, no, I don't want that to be true, but it's still true, right? And I, I need to yield to God's teaching on that. So, so as we get into this, it's going to be kind of strong, I hope, um, but we'll just see how the Lord leads. He may soften me up uh, as we move along here. So as I look at these verses from um, verse number 13 and following, or actually 14 and following, we recognize that the Lord is actually very seriously opposed to compromise in the church. He is very opposed to it. He does not like it. He doesn't care for carnality practiced within uh, the so-called body of Christ. He does not he, he does not even appreciate what I would call worldly worshipers. Now here's here's where the problem is today. I think we are building the church to be our church, not his church, right? He said it's my church and on this rock I will build my church. It's not ours. But what we do is we try to build the church on what we think is right. We try to build it on what we think fits the world around worldly philosophies. And what we've done is we've switched it over. We said, well, you know, let's change church so that the average lost person will feel comfortable in the, in the midst of holy people. And so what we've done is we've turned our worship services into some carnal practices in order to attract lost people. I'm going to tell you, and I'll say it till the day I die, I do not believe it is pleasing to God. Right. And, and the truth is, if you're lost, even your worship is unacceptable to, to God. You must be born again. Those that come to God must come through Christ. And just because you come and gather and worship 
doesn't mean you're born again. doesn't mean God accepts your worship. And so what happens is if we build our church on the carnal mentality, we end up with a lot of worldly worshipers, and those worldly worshipers become our members, and then when they become our members, they begin to vote on what we do or don't do, and when they vote on what we do or don't do, we become a worldly church in practice. Does that make sense? And I don't think the Lord likes that at all. I think everything we do should be done for the honor and the glory of God, don't you think? Everything. Uh, our harvest fest, it ain't about spooks and goblins and witches and uh, warlocks and pumpkins and patheticism. It's a, when we come to the harvest, man, we want to celebrate the God who has blessed us so abundantly, right? Amen. That's what we want to do, not focus on the wicked thing. Anyway, I'm getting offline there. So when we look at, I want to remind you that in Revelation chapter 1, verse 15, remember in the uh, revelation of Jesus there, Jesus was seen with feet like fine brass. Throughout scripture, the idea of brass uh, is connected with the idea of judgment. And so when you see the feet of Jesus, you often think about Jesus stamping out justice. And we, and I think that's the warning to this church. I think that's what Jesus is telling them. If you don't get things straightened out, I'm going to come. I'm going to fight amongst them. And, and we know because we're living in 2022, uh, we, we know that this church was stamped out a long time ago. And I'm not, I'm not so much sure that the world did that, but that Jesus did that. Not because they're not because of the faithful members, but because of the compromise. And they, they just slowly moved away from Jesus and the church died, right? It, it was dead eventually, and the Lord pretty much took the lampstand away and stamped it out in history. So I think we are living in a day where there's the same danger in the churches across our country and across the globe. And I think that God in a fresh way, is calling his people to remain holy unto him. Holy unto him. And the only way you're going to know how to do that is to study his word, right? We are living in a world where the spirit of Antichrist is absolutely exploding, right? It's not just that the people who don't believe have the spirit of Antichrist, but that it's beginning to infect our whole culture, our governmental system. Everything has sort of the spirit of get Jesus out, get God out. We can do this on our own. We're living in that day. We're living in a day of rampant materialism. We're living in a day of secularism and autolatry, which means the worship of self. We, we are there, man. People love themselves way more than they love God. And that's rampant in our society. It's rampant. Here's, here's the sad thing. It is rampant in the world. But what I find most distressing is that when I watch and attend churches, it is rampant in the church. Do you hear what I said? In the church where they're supposedly worshiping God, it's all about materialism, about big buildings, about secular ways of doing things. And if you watch those that perform the services, it's all about self and glorifying in themselves. And so I think this church certainly has a message for us, don't you think? Maybe. So now we come down, and with all of that kind of in our mind, and we see that we are to be uncompromisingly loyal to Jesus Christ, right? In our resolve, let's look at the culprits and the compromise in the church of purpose. Number one, or number three in your outline is the criticism level. This is on the back of your bulletin if you want to fill it in. By the way, I have it on somewhere with all of the stuff filled in. And you can have it after church. Okay, so criticism level in verse number 14 and verse number 15. False doctrine... Worldly compromise, listen to this, are so subtle, listen to me, pay attention, because this is likely to be the case in all of our lives, not just people that are way out there. If we're not careful, listen to me, worldliness and compromise are so subtle and deceptive, we need God to get our attention. You get what I'm saying? We'll be drifting along and all of a sudden we'll go, how did I get here? 
Why me? How did I get this far away from God? Because God stops us in our tracks and says, oh, you're one of my children, like you were saying in Sunday school. He chastens those he loves, right, to draw them back into his house because he loves us and he doesn't want us to experience the very worst in this life that can bring. So God has to step in, he has to intervene, has to wake us up, and he does that sometimes, and I think that is what we see in Pergamos. Now, I want to say this to you. I believe that that's why it's one of the most important things in your life to study God's Word. Amen. Listen to me. It's not just something you should do. It's something that is imperative that you do. You, excuse me, you need to know, thus saith the Lord. Because there are thousands of people, millions of people, who are professing the name of Christ, who are saying, God hath not said. I think God was thinking this. Mm -hmm. And then it's open for our interpretation. It's open for us to judge what God really meant by this vague general thought that he put out there. I'm going to tell you, I don't believe that for a minute. I believe God declared his word, and he had these holy men of old write it down. You have a word of God on the situation. Amen. It's not a maybe. It's not a, I, I thought about this, and it's sort of. So, so God, if we don't trust God's word, and, and I was watching something recently that kind of pointed this out, just the drift in the human intellectualism, and, and how it is so tempting to us to kind of move away from the Word of God. And it started all the way back in the 1800s when they began to question the creation. And once they did that, and once they got the church going, yeah, yeah, there's a gap between one and Genesis 1-1 one, one, and 1-2, and there's probably billions of years in that gap. The enemy knew he had a foothold in the door. Because then, when Jesus quotes the creation as if it's you know, literal, they're saying, well, he didn't know what he was talking about. He's a liar. He's a, see, see how he can attack, they can attack Jesus through that nonsense. So I'm just saying, when we drift into our human ingenuity, into the vagueness of thought, instead of the specificity of a spoken declaration. I, I wrote something down. I got this this week. It was by a guy, usually when something's from the Germans, you know, a high crit higher criticism, you know you need to pitch it out, right? Right? Mm -hmm. um, the higher critics basically were deniers of God's word for the most part. But anyway, we, you know, when you're in college, they make you study all that stuff anyway. Um, sad thing is many professors believe them. Uh, a lot of nonsense out there. But anyway, this guy's named uh, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe. All right? <laughs> Can't get any more German than that, can you? <laughs> Listen to what he says. I wanted to tell you this today because I think this captures this idea of, of the danger, although I think he's doing it because that's what he feels. But there's this danger when you get away from what God says to what I think he said, you're in trouble. And, and you'll hear all the things we've talked about before. Listen to what he says. He says, tis writ, or written for us. Tis writ, in the beginning was the Word. Now you and I say, Amen. And it was Jesus, right? They're like, well, no, no, wait. He says, I pause to wonder, what is really a verb? Did God really mean that? The Word cannot be supremely high. A new translation. I must try. I read if by the Spirit I am taught, then this is the sense. In the beginning was a thought. You see how we move from the declaration of the Word of God in the beginning to this sort of general thought of, well, we're not really sure about how it all began. I'll tell you how it began. Jesus was the Creator. You know that. You read it in Colossians, right? The Creator and Sustainer. Jesus was God who manifested in the flesh. And God in the beginning said, let there be, and there was. Amen. I, it, there's, there's nothing general about that thought. But if you get into generality of thought, it's, well, you know, billions 
And billions of years ago, when nobody was around but God, who's the only one that really knows, right? And then we started to come up with some crazy concept about creation. So I'm saying to you today, as the body of Christ, God didn't just think and daydream things. He said things. Amen. He declared things. And if we can throw that off, then we're left free in our human ingenuity and combine that with our sin nature, we will come up with all sorts of deceptions and lies for ourselves. We will accept compromise in all forms because we have released ourselves from the tether of truth and we are now free to simply float around in the movement of thought. Well, you know, what's true to me isn't true to you and it's sort of relative. And, and, and when you think truth is relative, I'll tell you, that's quicksand and it will draw your soul to hell. It will. It will draw you away from God. And so we're not free to do that. John 7, or, um, 17, 17. Uh, Jesus says, sanctify them through the, through the truth. He said, that's great. Well, what is the truth? Well, is it what James says it is? Is it what, what Sheila says it is? Is it what Martha says? It's what God says it is. He says, in, he says sanctify them through truth. Thy word is true. Not thy thoughts, but thy word. What he's declared, it is so. It's in black and white, right? Or red, if you have one of those translations. So without truth, think about this. Without truth, we will never know what God wants, right? We're always open to the latest fad or human idea about things. So in the Church of Pergamos, we know this, there are two major areas of compromise. One is identified as Balaam, the doctrine of Balaam. The doctrine of Balaam basically was to intermingle piety. It was to, 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 to compromise the people of God with worldliness. That's what it's really all about, and I'll show you that in a moment. It's like, it's like mixing the sacred with the common, which is exactly what modern churches are doing. They're, they're bringing the common things of the world from the nightclubs and they're bringing him into the holy sanctuary of God and they're mixing them with worship and they're saying, here God, here God, take what we offer you. And you mentioned Cain and Abel, right? Amen. And, and that we're offering what we want to offer to God, what we want to worship with, not what God seeks. And so we mix it up. We're like Balaam and, and mix godliness with worldliness, truth. They mix it up with um, traditions of men. They take pure fellowship of believers together and they blend them with unbelievers. And they say, well, here's the whole church. Listen, the church is the body of Christ. Amen. The church are born again believers knit together by the Holy Ghost. Now, we may have a particular fellowship, and that fellowship can have saved people and unsaved people in it. Okay? Just, just be aware of that. And so anyway, they're talking about mingling the two. And really, when you talk about the doctrine of Balaam, Balaam attacks personal holiness before God. They, they're saying, no, it's not that important. You don't, you don't have to be totally devoted. You know, love Jesus, receive Jesus, and trust Jesus, whatever your terminology is, but you don't have to live holy unto God. That's, that, uh, that's just those old timers, you know? Uh, um, but it attacks holiness. And then the second thing that we're going to deal with, and I'm going to get in more detail in both these as we move along, is the Nicolaitans. The Nicolaitans gives us the idea of a group of people who are basically, um, and the word is two words put together, it means to conquer Laos, the people. To conquer the people. And so the devil will use people in church life in order to pull people away from a pure, a simple, trusting faith in Jesus and will replace it with religion. And thereby, thereby remove you from the power of the spirit and give you the deadness of religion. Right. 
So these, that's sort of the idea of the Nicolaitans. These were, these were men who were elevating themselves, and they were basically paralyzing the kingdom movement by paralyzing the children of God. And they were, they were desiring personal glory, and they wanted to be honored. They wanted to be appreciated. They wanted to be lifted up. And, and they, they, they took authority that belonged to Jesus Christ alone and said it's us. We're the ones who can tell you what's right and wrong in the eyes of God. Listen, you got God's word in front of you, you can know it. Amen. Uh, you don't have to have some priest or pope or pastor somewhere who dictates to you what's right with God and what's not. You read the word. You study the word. You let God develop you in the spirit. And, and what happens if you don't, the devil will put somebody in your life that will. Yeah. Right? And then the last thing is they prance around in a vain show of the flesh, right? Does, does anybody, and I'm not going to call names like some people I see, but does any, has anybody ever noticed this? Have you seen any church services where it looks like they're prancing around in the van, vanity of their flesh? I mean, come on. I'm, I'm watching these modern pastors. I'm, I'm not kidding you. First, the coat's gone, which is, hey, that's not a big deal. But then they're wearing skin-tight muscle shirts. And then they make sure when they talk, it's like, <laughs> and the, the Lord said, oh, you know, prancing around in the bed. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, just listen to what they're saying. Stop being distracted by the muscle. <laughs> And even worse is women who are preaching, first of all, that's not biblical. And then they stand in the pulpit with skin tight everything. Don't stop looking at her and listen to what's being said and understand they're violating biblical truth. You shouldn't even be there. You shouldn't be watching this stuff. Prancing around in the vanity of their own flesh. Man, I think we have, it, it's not literally the Nicolaitans doctrine, but it's similar. And I think it's infected the modern day um, church organizations. So let's go back and talk about the Baal for a minute. Verse 14, you see that there? He says, I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. Now remember, the children of Israel in the Old Testament were the people of God, okay? Much like we are as the church. So he says, he taught the people of God to stumbling block, to eat things, sacrifice of the idols, and to practice fornication. So I kind of see a progression of thought there. But let me set the tone for you. This is defiling the body of Christ through polluting them with compromise. Yeah. You remember the story, right? It's found in the book of Numbers, uh, what, chapter 22 mm -hmm. and following. You get the story where... All right, Israel is now moving through this area. The king sees this nation of Israel, and he gets afraid. He thinks, man, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of refugees coming through here, and he gets afraid of them. So he hires this Gentile prophet whose name is Balaam, and he says, I want you to curse Israel so that I don't have to fear them. Let's get rid of them. Let's get them out of the picture, and I won't be afraid. And so Balaam says, how much are you going to pay me, right? Now, even as I say that kiddingly, it appears that Balaam seemed to know something about God. He seemed to be very aware or grasp the reality of the character of God. He seemed to understand the righteousness of God. I think he even understood that there is life after death. There is future after the grave. So, so in some ways, maybe God has been speaking to this guy's heart, but he definitely allows himself to become a pawn of the devil, right? And so he begins to try to curse the children of Israel. Let me ask you this. Did it work? Nope. It did not work. He couldn't do it. He tried several times. So what did he do? He goes back to the king and he says, listen, man, their God loves them. And I can't curse them. I just, boy, that's a word for the church today, right? Mm -hmm. True born again believers. Uh, he can't curse you. So what does he do next? If the devil can't kill you, he'll steal from you. He'll destroy your testimony, right? So compromise is the next thing. So he teaches the king. He says, tell you what, let's just get them to intermarry with our people. And before you know it, we'll become one people. 
So he's, this compromise is really what it's all about. So you got a guy who's doing it for hire, for the money, and then he starts blending and compromising the people of God with the people of the world. Now, does that not sound like the modern pulpits today? Doesn't it? Yeah. It, it does to me. I, I don't know if it does to you or not. And so what I'm going to do in, in, with the next three minutes I have <laughs> is I want to just kind of show you the progression of defilement as I see it. And, and again, you know how it is with preachers. Um, we can, as the Spirit leads us, I might see this side of an issue, and I might say there are 14 things of this. And, and James, as a preacher, might say, well, I see three sides, but he sees it from this angle and preaches it. And then James says, well, I see it from here, so I preach it from there. So sometimes there are slightly different ways we can see these things. That's how the Lord shows them to us. So I'm not being dogmatic with you about these things. I'm just saying these are some things I think the Lord has shown me. And the first thing is compromise. Defilement of a body of believers begins with embracing worldly wisdom. You start embracing the world of the, uh, worldly wisdom for your ministry activity, and it won't be long, and you'll be fully compromised. I promise you. Y'all remember Ray and Tina? Y'all remember back in Atlanta? I was just a young guy preaching, just getting first full-time ministry, and I think they thought I was crazy because I was always warning them about compromise. Dragging it into the church. Don't do it. Don't do it. And then I take those strong stands. Don't put that pagan pole up beside the church in order to get those radio waves in here and all that. They didn't do any of that. They said, okay, Pastor, that's the way you feel. That's the way God's leading us. We won't do it. But then later on, guess what happened? They did. They did anyway. And they, you know, I'm not, that's up to them. That's their choice. But I'm saying they saw me the same way you're looking at me now. You're nuts. I'm just telling you, I want you to be holy before God. I want you to experience the abundance of the power of living right before God. I mean, you can be saved and sin, and you forfeit your daily abundance. You get what I'm saying? There's, there's more than just going to heaven. God wants us to live in truth and in purity and in power now for his glory, for his honor, for the advancement of his kingdom and your testimony is way more powerful when you're not wallowing in the mud with lost people. Amen. Because when they look at you wallowing in the mud, they simply say, see, we don't need that. You think, well, if I wallow, they'll come to Jesus. Huh. That ain't how it works. Mm -hmm. They end up saying, see, I told you, it's never real for them, right? That's how it works. But anyway, so they trade the word of God for worldly philosophies, worldly mindedness. They become self-absorbed, situ situationally rel relative. They, we do church for success only. We do church in a sensual way like we see on television all the time. But the word of God teaches us that when it's done in the flesh, the flesh and the spirit are contrary one to another. And you are actually doing those things devoid of the spirit of God. Now, there might be a spirit in your meaning, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. It might be a religious spirit. It might be a fervent spirit. But if it's done according to the ways and the wisdom of the world, it is not a holy spirit. Amen. Ouch. I can't believe I said that. <laughs> so what happens is they begin to use the very word of God. So, wow. But the Bible says that we are under grace. We're not under the law anymore. So you can't say, well, Except the Bible says don't use grace as a license to sin. You don't stand back and say, well, I'm saved by grace. I'm kept by grace. Therefore, I can wallow with the pigs. That's that, if you're doing that, shows you got a spiritual problem, right? Saved or unsaved, you got a spiritual Here's what. Here's why you can't drift into thought. Because that's what everybody thinks, right? So what does God declare? You know what God declares? God forbid. Amen. You find it in Romans chapter 6. It says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Don't you know that you were baptized into Christ and were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him in baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we 
should walk, that's a lifestyle behavior pattern, in newness of life. Amen. Not the old sinful ways. Man, you get saved, you ought to be living differently. Amen. Living the way God wants you to live. And then he says, it goes on a few verses later, and he says, Likewise, reckon yourselves as dead, dead to sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? Don't yield yourself as members of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. You know, these, these members that, that are under, you know, still under the law of sin, he says, don't yield to it. Don't give in to it. Don't give over to it. Instead, take those same, same things that have the law of sin still working in them and give them to God. That's the only hope you have anyway, right? That's the only way we're going to overcome our flesh. And then he says this, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but you're under grace. So what shall we say then? Because we're not under the law, but under grace. Shall we sin? God for bid, right? Amen. And that's what happens when you got the spirit of Baal. Well, yeah, I know it says that, but he, he didn't really say. His thinking was, and we drift off into our ingenuity. Second thing, defilement of a church begins with embracing worldly philosophies. Notice secondly in this verse, they ate things sacrificed unto idols. Now personally, I think it's within the worship set. That's what I think. I think they are defiling maybe even the Lord's Supper table. Maybe not. I mean, we know in Corinthians it kind of deals with some of that. So that's possible. But I think that's really what we're dealing with. We're, we're talking about an ungodly group that's now entered into the church. And by the way, Balaam is connected to who? What, what false god? Baal. Baal. And so we know that they're bringing this stuff into the fellowship in different forms. I'm sure it's uh, covert. I'm sure it's hard to detect. But they're bringing wickedness into the church and into the, their personal lives. And, and they're eating things sacrificed unto idols. And so the doctrine at its core says that, you know what? Simple practices are okay as long as they accomplish a good end. Well, we've all heard that, right? Well, you know, there's got to be a certain style of music for the kids to come. And if it gets the kids, well, then it's worth it, right? Well, where do you draw the line? Where do you, well, if it's no big deal about the music, what about the dress? Because we've seen that change, right? And our church is not like this, but I've been in churches where it's, my soul will go put some clothes on. You know? It, what about the dress? Where do we draw? Oh, no. Dress how you want. Scripture says, no, ladies, be modest in your hair, right? And then, well, if that's all right, what about the dark arts? Why don't we invite, let's, I'll tell you what, we all need to get in shape, you know, I'm a, more than most. I'll tell you what, let's bring yoga in, and you can do yoga. Well, do you know that the poses supposedly make you a channel for demonic spirits? It's wickedness, but we bring in the church and say, well, you know, it worked to get people here in uh, you know, we all need to get in shape. Bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness with great gain. That's what's important, right? That's what's important in our lives. But anyway, so where do we draw the line? How about sex? What about sex? You know, a lot of these cult groups back in the early church that they were dealing with, sex was a part of their worship services. They draw a crowd, right? How about that? What, 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 if it's okay with any old music, if it's any old dress, why not sex? Where do you draw the line? I tell you, you need to draw the line with the word of God, not with a thought of how we should do church. Amen. That won't reach lost people. Right. Yeah. Let, let's, let's get our churches back to doing church for the glory of God and for the glory of God alone, right? Alone. Anyway, what is the prosperity gospel preaching? You know what they're doing? They're doing the doctrine of Baal. They're doing the ministry for money. Yeah. That's what they're doing. What does liberation theology teach? You know, it's just as sad. Many of our brothers and sisters of color in their churches were being taught liberation theology. You, you need to be set free from your oppressors. No, you know what you need to be set free from is your sinful nature. You need Jesus. 
Any Jesus but liberation theology captures the very ones that want to be free from their oppressors, and it oppresses them as well. All the while, the word of God stands as a citadel of truth, saying, love not the world, neither the things of the world. Right? All found in uh, 1 John. Chapter 2, 15, I believe it is. Yeah, okay. And then the final thing, I know we're out of time, but I, I think if I don't get this, it, if there is this wicked participation where he says, and commit fornications. And I personally, it could be physical, and that goes back to that sexual practice I was telling you about. But I think it's more referring to spiritual. They are fornicating. Say, we're going to have God on Sunday. And we're going to get in bed with the devil on Monday through Saturday. We're going to sing to God's glory on Sunday. We're going to sleep with the enemy the rest of the week. That, that's the idea. We'll commit fornications. A defiled church permits sin without any resistance. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's a lie. It matters. You want, you want to live in the abundance of Christ? And the beauty of holiness, man, you need to be faithful to him. Now, again, we've talked a lot about this because there's been some discussion over different theologies about salvation. And all. But I'm telling you, obedience is evidence that you've been born again. If you never want to obey God, if your heart doesn't care anything about what God says, then you have to wonder whether you really got saved, no matter what you said. Because we do have to confess unto salvation, but Romans chapter 9 says it begins with believing in the heart. And then we confess unto salvation. So with the heart man believes unto righteousness. I believe that God said what he said. He meant what he said. He said, if you will entrust Jesus with your life, I'll save you. I'll give you my righteousness in him. Just come to him. Trust him and you'll be saved. But I'm convinced that after that, when you really do that, your life's different. I mean, you're not perfect, right? None of us are. But, but your life definitely changes. And if you can just go wallowing off in any old faith, you can't be sure that you're saved. I'm not saying you're lost. I'm just saying you can't have that assurance that you can if you just do what God said. Anyway, wicked participation. And I want to close with that thought I mentioned a minute ago. Since the devil cannot curse you as a child of God, what he wants to do is get you to compromise. He wants you to forfeit the abundance that you have in Christ Jesus. He wants to cut you off from all the spiritual blessings that are yours and mine in Christ Jesus. He, he wants to quench the Holy Spirit through your, you and me being disobedient and, and not yielding and, and cut him off. Here, i got a question for you. Why would God bless you with stuff if he knows you're going to use it against him? You're actually cutting yourself off from the abundance. I didn't say from your salvation if you're saved. I'm talking about the abundant, full life that he wants you to have now. Does that make sense? A lot of stuff here. I could keep going. It's quarter at, or ten after already, so I better stop. All right, let's pray. Our fathers, we bow before you today. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the richness that is found in your holy word, your declaration to us. As children, and even as I call it a declaration, I realize that it is a love letter. It is you, the holy God, reaching out to an imperfect, sinful uh, creation and saying, listen, I can solve your dilemma. And you put on human flesh. You came to the earth and you lived that perfect life as the Lamb of God. And then when you died on that cross, you died there not because you had sinned, but because you allowed our sin to be heaped on your son, Jesus. And he paid the penalty for us so that we might then be able to die to that sinful nature as he did and then be raised to newness of life in the spirit. Lord, we just pray for those in this room, maybe somebody's here and they've never really understood that before. They thought, well, i got to do this, 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 and this to get saved or go to heaven. And they've never really realized they must believe on Jesus to be saved. And I pray your Holy Spirit would just convince them of that need this morning.
they might turn to you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's stand together, James. It's short. You may already know it. It's page 214. It's, oh, how he loves you and me. Very simple. Oh, how he loves you.